Great, Hayo. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Yeah, when when Hayo invited me, I was a bit reluctant because uh, I wasn't sure that you would be um, interested in what I would have to say. Um, so uh, this is really a, a bit of an experiment. So this is me trying to reach out to a different community, and uh, and I've been as preparation for this presentation. I've been trying to think about what the the developments in the semantic web over the last uh, 20 years, which have become really accelerated in the last 10 years, how they are relevant for uh, for this community. And so I hope that I managed to make that bridge um, and uh, that we will have a discussion afterwards. So information systems in the linked data era and for linked data, uh, you can also read semantic web. Okay, so we started out under this name semantic web. Um, but, uh, and it's a cool name, but we also always had to explain what it was and semantic, it rhymes with pedantic. And uh, so uh, I think now linked data is a more commonly known uh, phrase for what is essentially the, the same idea. Um, so uh, to do some expectation management uh, to start out with, as I said, I'm not one of you, right? So uh, I'm a semantic web researcher. Uh, but from my semantic web perspective, I am observing, I'm seeing changes in information systems. And I, I, I think I see how semantic web technology is impacting on how companies and organizations are uh, arranging their information systems. So think of me as a visitor from another planet and I'm, uh, I'm reporting what's happening on my planet and how, and, and uh, help me to interpret now, how uh, changes on my planet uh, affects the life on your planet. Um, and all visitors from a, a foreign civilization, I come in good company. Um, we even brought our king, right? Um, so with such a big uh, representation of the Netherlands uh, at this conference, we thought we would also bring our king. Our king is in town today for an official state visit. Um, so we couldn't have asked for, for better company. Um, so this is the plan for the talk. Um, first, uh, a sort of a very uh, uh, quick introduction of linked data and the semantic web. What are the core ideas? What is the core technology involved? Uh, what are the problems that we are trying to solve? How do we go about solving them? Um, once you have a, a, a good grip of the idea, the core ideas of semantic web and linked data, uh, then I will look at deployments of linked data in information systems, right? And, and that part of the talk is very much rooted in, uh, in, in practical applications that I've seen happening over the, the past uh, five years, mostly. Um, and then finally, I'll ask uh, now if we can see patterns in how uh, this semantic web technology is, uh, is affecting the architecture of, uh, of information systems. So this all started out with uh, this man. Uh, I assume that all of you know who he is. Uh, at, uh, in our community, we call him his Timness. So his Timness is Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web. Uh, and if you look at the very early documents that he wrote about the World Wide Web, he wasn't actually thinking about uh, a web of documents and a web of text and a web of pictures. He was already in the very early days, he was thinking of a web of data. Right? He was interested in, originally his motivation was, to share information among physicists about all these big machines that they were using in CERN and all the computing systems that they were using in CERN. So he wasn't interested in swapping documents around, he was interested in sharing data. Um, and here's a quote from him from the late 90s. Uh, so, uh, so this is an itch that we feel uh, all of us every day. There is a lot of data that we use every day, but it's it's not part of the web. Now, I can see my bank statements on the web. I can see my photos on the web. I can see my calendar on the web, but I cannot integrate them. And of course, that's not necessarily the public web. Right? My, my photos may not be on the public web. They may or may not be. My bank statements certainly are not on the public web. Right? Uh, but I cannot use the web to combine these things. So I can... Uh, why can I not uh, uh, look at my calendar and click on my calendar and immediately see the photos that I have from that day? 
if I get a strange bank statement, then I want to figure out mm, where was I? Why do I get this strange uh, 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 charge to my bank? I want to click on my bank statement and see my calendar and realize, oh yeah, I was in France that day and I was paying for the toll road and I forgot. So that's what this bank state, I cannot integrate these. I, why can I not integrate these while all of these are on the web? It is because all of these are in different silos. Right? There is a web of documents, there is a web of pictures that we can all integrate, but there is not a web of data. Right? Each application uh, keeps data to itself. This is all siloed. So here's another way of, of saying the same thing. So what's wrong with the web? Right? So, so this is the web, okay? With lots of pages with text, and some of these have pictures on them, and they all link to each other. Right? Um, and of course, uh, we didn't uh, write the web by hand. Right? So we, nobody knows how many web pages there are, somewhere between 50 and 100 billion, but then there is the dark web, so we certainly don't know how many pages there are there, and we didn't write them all down by hand. Now, there is an Amazon, there is not somebody sitting down writing product pages by hand. There is information systems. There is databases, information systems that uh, uh, generate the content from our, our websites. Right? Uh, now, if I want to, uh, on a review site, I want to link, uh, say, a product page from uh, uh, one supplier with a product page from another supplier, I can link the web pages, but I cannot link the data. Right? So I can make a link between one camera supplier and another camera supplier, right? but only at the level of the web pages. Now, you may think that that's a cool thing, but it's actually a very poor thing to do. Why? Because the data from one camera supplier and the other camera supplier was originally in highly structured information systems, right? and we can only link that information after we publish it on the web. And when we publish it on the web, we more or less throw out the baby with the bathwater. We've lost pretty much all the structure that we have in our information system. So in my information system, I knew that one number is the price, and the other number is the, is the product number. Right? And I know that uh, I want to minimize one, but not the other. Right? All of this is obvious in my information system. And it's also obvious in the information system of the other supplier. And I know which fields I want to compare with each other. I'm interested in comparing the prices. I'm not interested in comparing the product numbers. But by the time I've published it on the web, everything has become HTML. Everything has become text. Right? Uh, so uh, I can no longer uh, uh, easily recognize, or at least I have to do a, a lot of hard work to recognize that one number is the price and the other is the product number. And which one do I want to compare with which other one? And so what we would really like to do is keep that structure while we are linking the information systems instead of first publishing the information systems on the web, throwing away all the structure, and only then being able to link it. So what we would really like is this. Right? We would really like to be able to link the information system, but of course we can't. Right? So uh, if uh, one camera wants to link to the products of another camera supplier, there is no way in which they can link, deep link inside the information system of, uh, of the other supplier. Right? The, the information systems, they are uh, inside the company. You cannot even reach them from the outside, even if, it, if, you, if they would want to uh, uh, allow that. Uh, then the structure is opaque. There is, a there is not even protocols that they can use to talk to each other, or if there are, there are incompatible protocols. So until now, what we do is a poor man's job. We first publish everything on the web, throw away the structure, and then interlink it. Can we not make the world like this, now that we actually interlink our uh, information systems. This is what we are, the problem we are trying to solve uh, with, yeah. that's why link data is a, is a good name. That's exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to link these data sources. So essentially there are now two problems that we have to solve in order to do that. We have, uh, of course, the physical integration. We have the problem that information systems live in different organizations. They live in different parts of the planet. They live as part of different uh, uh, information architectures. So we have to do this physical integration. How do I even physically you know, link to an, an, a data item in somebody else's information system? And even if I could physically link to that information item, then we still have the semantic integration problem, right? Because my data schema will be different from your data schema. So how do we manage uh, that, uh, what I call uh, a price 
uh, uh, you call something completely different. Right? So we have the physical integration to solve and the semantic integration to solve. And that's why Semantic Web was originally the name of this enterprise, right? Because we're trying to solve, we're using semantic technologies, and I will explain to you uh, what we mean by that for the content integration, and we're using web technology for the physical integration. Right? So Semantic Web, two names, two words, for one for each of those two problems. Okay, so, so this is the picture what I would like to achieve. Right? So now the question is, well, okay, how do you go about doing this? How do you use web technology? And how do you use semantic technology? And what is it even to achieve this uh, hope of being able to integrate uh, remote, distributed, heterogeneous information systems? Um, and uh, there, I'm going to explain this uh, in uh, the next couple of slides. Uh, but uh, I also want to show you a movie of a... Uh, a Silicon Valley company that has also been uh, deploying this technology. And it's a very illustrative uh, movie. Uh, so I want, want to try and play it, see if the technology works. Uh, it's a very good explanation of what's to come in the next part of the talk. Uh, but I have to warn you, uh, this is a Silicon Valley promo video. So they speak at about 2,000 words a minute. So um, you have to listen carefully. You know what drives me crazy about words? Oh. They have a million different meanings. Like, that is not what I had hoped. Check this out. Someone says, I love Boston. Now, they probably mean, I love Boston, the big city in Massachusetts, but they could be referring to one of the 26 other Bostons that are scattered around the globe. But if it's during the playoffs, they're probably referring to the Celtics. Of course, you and I both hope they're talking about the Boston. You know. <laughs> But I guess there's really no way of knowing. The problem is that the same word can mean so many different things. Because of that, when it comes to finding, linking, reconciling, or organizing multiple layers of information, words are not the best solution. So this is exactly the problem I was just paint painting, right? So that if we try to integrate things on the web, all we have to integrate with is words, right? And words are not a very good uh, way of integrating information. multiple layers of information, words are not the best solution. The guys at grocery stores figured this out back in the 60s when they started putting barcodes on everything so that products with the same name wouldn't get confused. So how come on the web, so many sites still try to organize stuff with words? Say you're a product guy at a big music site and you want to pull in feeds of lyrics and videos and photos from all of your data suppliers, but everyone uses different names for things and a lot of the feeds don't even match up. So you've got to reconcile them and pull in updates and deal with merges and deletes and splits. It's a nightmare. Mommy. But what if there was a better way? Welcome to MetaWeb. MetaWeb is a service that helps you build your website around entities and not just words. Whoa, what's an entity? Well, the simple answer is it's a singular person, place, or thing. Okay, well, let's compare that to text. Did you know that on the web there are more than 50 different ways people write UC Berkeley? And they're really all just talking about one single place, one entity. By mapping all those words to a single entity as if it had its own barcode, you can combine all of that information about UC Berkeley into one place. But that's just the beginning. Because entities represent unique real-life things, we can build a map that shows how they're related. So you can look for things that share certain attributes, like actresses, under 20, from New York. Can you imagine trying to find that with a keyword search? Entities are just smarter than words. So MetaWeb's been in the process. Okay. So uh, if you go to metaweb.com, you will find that they no longer exist. Okay, uh, uh, so uh, later on in the talk, we'll hear what happened to them. Um, so I'm now going to go over exactly the same points that, that he made in those two and a half minutes, right? And essentially, uh, linked data uh, rests on four principles, okay? Uh, give all things a name, make a network of relations between these things that have a name, make sure these names are URIs, and apply semantic technology. So we're going to go over each of those four uh, principles. So the first principle is the easiest one to grasp, right? So give everything a name. So this is my favorite Farsight cartoon, right? So the door, the pants, the dog, right? And he says, well, so that should clear up a few things around here. Right? So he has, he has named everything, right? And of course, to some extent, we already do this in, in databases, 
right? We give identifiers for persons and places and organizations and, and so on, right? But we take, the, on the semantic web, we really take this to the extreme. So we want identifiers for everything in our, uh, in our information system. We want an identifier for dates, for years, for events, for, uh, um, uh, so, everything that we could possibly want to name or that plays a role in our information system, we make up an identifier for that thing. We also make up identifiers for types of things. Okay, okay so things are nice, but uh, what really matters is the relationships between things. Right? So we want, to ex we want to express that a certain product has a certain price or that a certain product is provided by, an, uh, by a certain supplier. Okay, so we take these entities as the nodes in a very large graph, and the links in that very large graph are the relationships between those entities. That's a very natural representation of information. But notice that this is a different data model than what we are used to in databases, right? The standard database model is a table, right? It's a rectangular shaped uh, thing. This is a network shaped thing, right? So we're choosing here a different information model, namely our information is graph shaped, right? Uh, where the nodes are the objects and the links are the relationships between the things. And we will later see this uh, example back again. So here is some example from the movie world, right? So we have identifiers for actors and we have identifiers for movies and uh, we have relationships between what actor plays in which movie and we have identifiers for types. So we have the type of all actors and the type of all movies and relationships between those. So we can say that something is a movie because there is a relationship between that thing and the type of all movies, right? And we will later see that I'm not making up this knowledge graph. This knowledge graph is, this part of a knowledge graph is taken from one of the biggest applications of knowledge graphs in the commercial world. So two very simple principles. So one, make up names for things. Two, uh, shape your information as a network of relationships between those things, as a very large graph, right? Third principle, is where the web comes in. So when I said we choose names, we don't just choose arbitrary names. Right? The rule is that every name that we make up must be a web address. So actually I was cheating a little bit on this knowledge graph because here it said that this uh, uh, some entity for uh, Robin Wright, the, the actress, uh, was a uh, MID 127, right? Uh, but actually, uh, that MID 127 uh, should actually have been a URI. Okay? It was too long for me to write down, so I didn't bother. But we're going to uh, uh, enforce that every name for every identity is a web address. So this should be HTTP colon slash slash um, uh, internet movie database slash uh, actors and actresses slash Robin Wright. Okay? Uh, and that holds for everything. So that not only holds for and movies, but also for like uh, uh, years. So HTTP colon slash slash uh, uh, date and time authority slash year slash uh, uh, 2018. Okay, that's the identifier for the current year, right? Um, uh, and why is it so important that these uh, names are URIs? Well, the nice thing about URIs, there are two things nice about URIs. One is they are a globally uh, uh, coordinated namespace. Right? They give you globally unique names. Right? And two, you can always point to them. Right? That is not true in information systems. Right? There is no guarantee between two information systems that they don't use the same name for different things. Right? And there is certainly not possible to link to the name in another information system. But if we make sure that these names are URIs on the web, we can, right? just as on the web, Anybody can say anything about anything, right? So if, uh, of course, at the end of the day, you are all writing your blog, as you all do at the end of every day, um, about your conference uh, uh, experiences, and you want to write about the, the keynote of Van Harmelen this morning, right? And you want to point to my slides or to my website, then you don't need to phone me up and say, what's the secret identifier of your homepage? You can just find it and link to it. And you don't need to ask me permission asking, uh, well, uh, is it okay if I link to your, uh, to your secret address? You can just do it. And you can say whatever you want about it. You can say the talk was great or the talk was boring, or, right? Uh, 
uh, you can say, anybody can say anything about anything. This is also true for these data URIs. So here's a very concrete example. Um, anybody knows what this is? No medical staff in the room, this is aspirin, okay? And now imagine that uh, uh, the European uh, Drug Agency wants to say that they have approved aspirin as a painkiller, right? Uh, so that's the kind of thing that the, the European Drug Agency uh, does. So they want to say that that drug, for, as far as they're concerned, is now of, par of type analgesic, uh, the medical term for painkillers. Um, now, how uh, would you do this on the web? Well, there is a, a URI, uh, a web addressable name for the drug. This could be uh, http colon slash slash buyer dot de slash drug slash aspirin, right? Buyer, the, the, su the supplier of aspirin. So that's a, 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 the X is a URI on the supplier's website. Uh, the T for the terminology that uh, they use, uh, actually analgesic is a term from SNOMED. Right? And SNOMED is an internationally used medical vocabulary uh, uh, built and maintained by uh, the American uh, 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 College of Internal Medicine. Right? So that's an American uh, maintained vocabulary. And then some European agency wants to say that uh, that thing is of that type. So this is a URI in Germany, a URI in the US, and a, a statement on a, on a European agency's website. And they don't need to ask Bayern, or they don't need to ask uh, the American uh, of internal medicine. But they can just make this statement. Okay. Um, so it's important to realize that not only are those on physically different locations, uh, they are also uh, organizationally different. Right? They are separate organizations that can integrate their information by simply making that link between information on one website and the information on another website and making a statement on a third website that combines these two. So that's a very powerful mechanism that we inherit by a simple trick of demanding that all our uh, names for entities are web addresses. Okay. So no, the semantic web looks like this. Okay, so there is a data entity on, on one place, a, a data entity on another place, and a third place that, that links the two. So together, these three principles, names for everything, relationships in a big graph between all these names, and all these things are URIs on the web, together they produce one giant global graph. Right? So maybe this is not the www, the World Wide Web, this is the, the GGG, right? the giant global graph. Uh, but it's just a graph. Okay? It's just a, a, a very big network of entities. So where's the, that's the web. Well, we've now seen the web. We haven't seen the semantic yet. So where is the semantic part of all this? Well, that is the fourth principle. Right? So the fourth principle is use explicit and formal semantics. Uh, and this is a very lightweight form of inform enforcing semantics. So this is the kind of semantics that every information modeling method would agree on before they break out into a fight. Right? So there's lots of different ways of information modeling, but they all agree on uh, types, and uh, uh, having relationships, having types, organizing these types in a hierarchy, and, and, and imposing constraints on possible interpretations of these types. Right? And after that, they all start differing and have different opinions, but this is fairly common ground. Now, what do I mean by semantics? Okay, so um, uh, here is my attempt at explaining this. Um, this is one of these uh, relationships on the semantic web. Okay, blob one has some unknown relationship to blob two. And actually any item in any information system looks like this to your computer. Okay? So you may think that camera has price $50 is a meaningful thing to your computer. Well, it isn't. Okay? It only means this to your computer. Uh, so how can one computer send this to another computer and they make that they have some hope of information integration? Right? They don't even know what this means. Uh, just like I cannot send this to you and hope that you will use this in the way that I intended, right? because you have no way of knowing what I meant by this. But actually there is a way of transmitting a little bit of shared meaning. Okay? So uh, what if I do this? Blob one is married to blob two. Okay? Now I can predict what you're thinking. Right? I now know for sure that you have just concluded that blob one and blob two are both people. Right? Because the only things that can get married in this world are people. 
right? Uh, so, and how come that I could predict what you were thinking? No, I could predict that you had concluded that those two must have been people. I could predict that you were concluding this because I knew that we were sharing a little bit of background knowledge, right? And only a tiny bit of background knowledge was enough. So if we share the background knowledge that uh, Mary too relates one person to another person, right? That is a very simple bit of background knowledge. And if we share that, then I can at least a little bit predict what it is that you, how you will interpret this information. Right? So think of this as a very simple ontology. Right? It's a very simple ontology that states one type constraint on one relation. Right? And it reduces the amount of confusion that there could possibly be between us when we send information. So this produces a, a lower bound in the things that uh, uh, you must believe. Right? So if I send you this information with this background knowledge, you are forced to believe that those two things are people. So it's a, it's a lower bound in what you believe, and therefore it's a, it's a lower bound uh, to the degree of, uh, of uh, uh, misunderstandings that there can exist between us. Not only can I impose an, a lower bound, I can also impose an upper bound. I can also forbid you to believe certain things. So what if I send you this? Okay. Oh, this is a bit strange. Right, so in the Netherlands, we're a very tolerant country. Lots of people can get married to lots of other people, but you still got to be married to one person at the same time. Okay, so what's going wrong here? Okay, uh, well, if I tell you that uh, married to relates one person to one other person, another bit of background knowledge that we share, you must conclude that uh, uh, these two blobs on the right hand side, they must be the same person. So maybe one of them is uh, uh, the the girl's name, uh, and one of them is the married name of uh, of a woman, or uh, two different uh, 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 two different names of the same person. Right? So you can no longer believe that this person is married to two other persons because we share this bit of background knowledge. So there is an upper bound on what you are allowed to believe. Right? So logically speaking, this amounts to introducing negation. Right. So by sharing a little bit of uh, ontology, I can put a lower bound in what you must believe. I can put an upper bound on what you are allowed to believe. And when the ontology grows, and this is a very tiny ontology of only two statements, but when the ontology gets bigger, the lower bound goes up and the upper bound goes down and the possible space for misunderstanding between us, or actually the possible space for misunderstandings between our information systems is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So by extending the ontology, right, by making it semantically richer, there is less space for a misunderstanding. Right? So by adding semantics, uh, we increase interoperability. So whenever you see the word semantics, okay, uh, uh, now think semantics just means predictable inference. Okay? We share semantics if I can send you something and I can predict what it is that you will do with it. This is not the meaning of semantics that you will get if you go to a logic course. Right? They have weird stories about model theory and mappings between syntax and semantics. And uh, I think this is for computer science, the wrong way of thinking about it. Any logicians in the room that I've just insulted? Uh, but the, for, for computer science, for information systems, semantics, the more fruitful way of thinking about it is predictable inference. The more semantics we share, the better I can predict what you will do with this information. Okay. So those were the four principles. No, names for things. Organize them as relationships in a big graph. Make sure these relationships, are, these things are entities on the web and add shared semantics, shared background knowledge uh, for interoperability. Okay. So indeed, we have now used the web, the use of URIs to allow physical integration between you know, geographically or organizationally distributed information systems. And we have used semantics uh, to integrate the meaning of content. All right. So. This is the, the the textbook story, right? Go to any textbook on on link data or semantic web technologies, and you will find this. Now, follow any any course uh, on the topic, and you will get this uh, in more detail and longer and deeper, uh, and so on. There are formal languages underlying this, right? So there are languages like RDF, RDF schema uh, for expressing these very big uh, uh, graphs of entities and relationships between them. That's what RDF does. There is a schema language called RDF schema for exchanging a little bit of semantics. RDF schema is a very poor language. It can only say all the things that we would agree on 
uh, before the fight breaks out. Uh, and then OWL is a much richer uh, language for expressing the semantics. Right. So uh, I'm not going to go into the details of all these languages because you know you can pick up a textbook or follow any of the courses and figure out and uh, use any of the tools. But these are the principles underlying them. All right, so fine. That's a nice story. You can write a textbook about it. Has this actually uh, made any impact? Is anybody actually uh, no, is anybody actually using this? Does this really exist? So. Yes, it exists, right? There is now a, just as there is a worldwide web of documents, there is now a worldwide web of data, the linked data web, or also known as the linked open data cloud, the LOD cloud. And that LOD cloud consists of lots of data sets which are interlinked, right? So what you see here, every bubble is itself a very large network. So this is a network of networks. Every bubble is a big information network. And whenever there's an arrow, it means that items from one information graph are interlinked to the items in the other information graph. So this is a very early uh, picture where, uh, so what is on this uh, semantic web? What is on this linked open data cloud? Well, for example, all of Wikipedia, okay? So that's a lot. So we take Wikipedia, which is nice for us to read, text and pictures, not so nice for your information system. We take all of the info boxes on, on Wikipedia, call it DBpedia, and make all of that available uh, in uh, along the principles that we just discussed. Okay. So the fact that uh, you know, Tallinn is the capital and of which country it is the capital and what are the neighboring countries and what is the president and so on, now, all of that information, all of the information that you can find in Wikipedia available as linked data on the web. Um, uh, Geonames, I don't think between us in this room, we can think of a single name of a village or a mountaintop or a river or a valley that has not listed in geonames. Now, okay, we didn't build this as semantic web researchers. Geographers have been building this catalog over, over centuries, right? But now they have published this catalog as linked open data, as a very big knowledge graph uh, on the linked open data cloud, right? Um, the census data, uh, the US census data, but also the European Office of Statistics, all of their data is uh, available as linked data on the on the linked open data cloud. And uh, this amounts now to billions of facts and rules. Okay? Um, this is changing all the time. Um, it's growing all the time. It's becoming so hard that it's now uh, difficult to measure. Um, I think in my lab, we are one of the two or three labs that still have the capability to measure how big this thing is. Um, uh, it is somewhere between a 50 and 100 billion facts and rules, right? So between 50 and 100 billion things to say about things in the world, from cameras to countries and from medicine to politics and so on. Uh, so what would you do with this uh, network? Oh, so here, here's some of the content. And I already mentioned DBpedia. I mentioned geonames, uh, art, artists and artworks. Uh, so the Paul Getty Foundation has a huge uh, 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 thesaurus of everybody who ever made anything that you would call an artwork, right? from painting to music to poetry and so on, all of that available on the web and interlinked. Right? So if it says that Rembrandt van Rijn was born in Leiden, then Leiden is not just a string. Leiden is a pointer to an entity in geonames. And Leiden is a pointer to an entity in DBpedia. Right? So uh, all of this can now be integrated. Um, scientific bibliographies, if you if you were quick, you saw that DBLP uh, is uh, on the semantic web, which means that all of you will already have semantic web identifiers for you. There is a semantic web identifier, a URI for each of you, because each of you have published in computer science. All of you will appear in DBLP. You will have an author entity, an, an author entry in DBLP. There is a semantic web entity for it, right? So without knowing it, you're already part of the semantic web. Dictionaries for uh, human languages, uh, scientific databases, um, popular culture, uh, and so on. So what would you do with this? Well, you know, so take DBLP, right? You take your favorite computer researcher, right? Uh, and um, you want to, you find out uh, what their publications are. Not by browsing it in your web browser. No, no, by querying it in your information system. Right? This is a very large structured information graph. It's a knowledge graph that you can query over the web. And then you may find out 
uh, that, uh, oh, there is also a DBpedia page for your favorite author, right? And on the DBpedia page, it actually lists that this author also has written books. Well, you didn't know that because DBLP doesn't list books. Uh, but in, in DBpedia, you find out that this author has also written a book. Okay, now you go to the RDF book mashup. Uh, you find out what are the co-authors of the book. Right? You find out that the co-author also has a DBpedia page. Right? You can go to the social network of those authors. So within a few queries, which is the equivalent, the information system equivalent for you know, what you do when you click on the web. When you click on a link on the web, you hop from one website to the next for, through interlinked information. Uh, here, your information system is querying, right? and it's hopping from one information system to the next to, within a few queries, find out what is the social network of the co-authors of a person that you were looking for. So if you're ever looking for reviewers, this is what you want. Right? And this gets bigger every month. So how big is this getting? Well, here is a timeline. So this is growing uh, a lot. These are snapshots over the different years, over the last uh, 10 years. Uh, so this is getting, uh, so color-coded is roughly indication for the domain. So some of this is scientific information, some of this is medical information, some of this is cultural information, so on. So you see that this is getting uh, bigger and bigger. The center node there is DBpedia. So DBpedia is uh, informally beginning to serve as a kind of hub on this network. Now, just as the regular web has hubs that everybody points to, uh, the semantic web has hubs. And when you have an entity for D uh, on DBLP, you have an entity for, for, for an author, then DBLP also links to the DBpedia entry for that author. And from that DBpedia entry, you can get to many other uh, information sources about that author. Okay. Now, actually, there are two uh, central hubs, right? So uh, both GeoNames and DBpedia are becoming central hubs. Uh, so this is now becoming so big that we can no longer read the items, right? And uh, each of these circles is a, a network of networks, right? So DBpedia is, is, is here just a single big bubble, but actually DBpedia is a huge network of other things which are themselves networks. So this is a very deeply nested structure. Um, and this is now somewhere between 50 and 100 billion facts and rules about just about everything that you could possibly imagine. Okay, so okay, so this thing actually exists. So this is not just uh, some academic dream. Right? This actually exists. Now, is anybody really using this? Okay. And now, I think we're going to get close to, to your world. Right? So we're going to look at how organizations use this structure to organize their, uh, their information systems architectures. Um, here is a... A bunch of their logos, and you will see these are all companies which are uh, whose goal in life is not to use the semantic web. Their goal in life is something else. Their goal in life is to sell cars, or to sell books, or to sell you other stuff, uh, or to give you advice, or to give you uh, media uh, information. Right? But they all are deploying semantic web technology because it helps them to do their primary mission better. Right? Uh, and you see uh, all the big search engines there. We will talk about them. But you also see manufacturers. Uh, we will talk about NXP is one of them. You will see publishers there. Um, and I saw Springer is one of the sponsors of the conference. Uh, and I will actually say a little bit about Springer uh, uses the information. You see governments, the European Commission, for example, but also many national governments. You also see all the big uh, Chinese internet names, so that just as uh, the US has the big five. China has their big four, and all of them are very heavily investing in uh, 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 semantic web technology. So let's look at a few of these examples. We'll look at examples from search, from data integration for manufacturing, the content reuse in the media industry, uh, product search for retailers, and data publishing from governments. And this is just a handful of examples. Uh, there's many, many more. But these are illustrative for what's going on. So until a few years ago, the front page of Google looked like this. Right? If you would search, in this case, I would search for Utrecht. Utrecht is a city in, the, in our country. Uh, and then you would get this. Right? So you would get the home page of the city. You would get the Wikipedia page of the city. Uh, you would get uh, something about the university, about the football club, some tourist information, a happy mix of all kinds of stuff about Utrecht. Right? Of course, now you still didn't know anything about Utrecht. 
because you have to go away and click on those links and find out. And then in the spring of 2015, the front page of Google changed. So the front page of Google now looks like this. Okay. So now Google suddenly knows about Utrecht. It knows where it is in the Netherlands. It knows what it is. It's a city. And it knows all kinds of stuff about it, about how many people live there and where it's located and so on. Right. Now, where did it get this from? Well, it didn't get this from reading web pages. Okay. So even Google cannot read web pages. Right. Uh, and certainly not reliable enough to produce this. They get this from the semantic web. Right? They harvest semantic web knowledge graphs uh, and use this to generate these info boxes. Um, and actually, Utrecht is an interesting case because, um, okay, it's a little bit of a bug in the system of our country. Utrecht is both the name of a province and the name of the capital of that province. Okay, so that wasn't a very smart decision, but uh, too late to change now, right? And if you would scroll down the list on the left, you would just have pages about the city and pages about the province uh, just happily intermixed. Hey, it's the same word. What does Google know? Right? But here you will see that this is about Utrecht, the city, and there is also Utrecht, the province. Okay. And this is a blue link. So this is a node in the knowledge graph. You can click on this and you would knowledge graph about the province of Utrecht. So now it understands the difference between the city and the province with the same name. So it has really captured a little bit of that information because it shares a, a, an ontology with the suppliers of this information. Okay, so this is how uh, all the big search engines now use this. So how do they do this? Well, they must somehow share background information, right? You must have a shared ontology. Otherwise, it is just one blob relation another blob. And that one is a province and the other one is a city. And it's one is located in the other, but not vice versa. You can only figure this out if you share background knowledge. So how do they share background knowledge? Through something called schema.org. So schema.org is a medium-sized, not very large ontology. It's about uh, 600 types and about 1,000 properties. And it is co-developed by all the big search engines and the community. So six days a week, uh, Google and Bing are trying to compete with each other and kill each other. And on Sunday afternoon, they collaborate. right? And on Sunday afternoon, they collaborate on schema.org, on a shared vocabulary. Right? Because this vocabulary only works if it is shared between the search engines and the information suppliers. Right? <laughs> so that the Dutch government says, ah, ah, this is the town Utrecht, and this is the province Utrecht. And Google understands what you mean by town and province, because both of those are entries in a shared ontology. So this uh, shared ontology is now used by uh, uh, up of 10 million sites. Now, that may sound a big number, but it isn't, because we have billions of websites, so 10 million is a very small number. But it is the most important 10 million. Right? So uh, information from schema.org shows up in a third of all the Google search results. So this very tiny fraction of the web is actually the fraction of the web that is responsible for, for a very large proportion of all of our search results. Right? So this is really very crucial now. This started out as an enterprise by, uh, uh, by uh, Google, uh, Bing, and Yahoo, and it is now a community effort run by the World Wide Web Consortium. So this is a, a high-level view of what schema.org looks like, so this shared ontology. right? So it, they talk about places like provinces and cities, but organizations, uh, creative works. So for example, all of the national libraries and musea in Europe publish their information using schema.org right? so that if you look for uh, the girl with the pearl earring from Vermeer, right? Is this a book or is it a painting? Well, actually, it's both, right? But if you look for the painting, then Google knows which one is the book and which one is the painting, because both of those are subclasses of creative work. Right, so that was for search. Um, oh, by the way, um, interlude, uh, I managed W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium. As you know, that is the organization that makes sure the web continues to work. The only reason the web works is because we've standardized HTML. And somebody who writes a web page uses the same language as somebody who builds a browser and who wants to read the web page. Right? And HTML is stable, the web works. The same organization also makes sure that these languages like RDF, RDF Schema, and OWL are stable. Right? So they are no longer in the hands of uh, uh, academics, so they are no longer What's it called? You have hardware, software, and uh, professorware. Uh, so they are no longer professorware. 
but they are you now in the hands of a well-recognized uh, standardized standard organization that makes sure that these are stable and when there are changes that they are well managed. Okay. Uh, end of aside. So my first example was a search. My second example is from manufacturer NXP. Um, maybe not many of you have heard of them, but all of you are customers uh, because they make the chips in your phone. They don't make the big CPU chip, right? That's the Intels of this world, world, but they make all the other ones. So they make the temperature sensor, they make the camera chip, they make the accelerometer, et cetera, et cetera, right? They make the GPS chip. And they have lots of variations of these. So they have a, 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 a temperature sensor that works on five volts and a temperature sensor that works on two and a half volts. And, uh, and a temperature sensor that works at very high temperature, and so on. So uh, all of the big hardware makers uh, are uh, their customers. So of course, you know, uh, people like Samsung and, and Apple for their phones, but also, uh, say, car makers. Right? So the chip that makes sure that your airbag uh, expands when your car suddenly stops, that's, that chip is an accelerometer, and it's, it's made by, by NXP. So they had a huge portfolio of products. Right? They had 26,000 and upwards of products. And they couldn't even find their own specs anymore, right? Because these were different departments that were designing different chips. And they were, did we built this before, but well, we don't know. So we worked with them in some projects and we asked them, um, how, many, how many databases uh, do you have? Okay? And you know, you know what the answer was? The answer was, we don't know, okay? Uh, and they're not the only organization uh, for wh whom this is the case, right? So even their engineers could no longer find the specs or the salespeople could no longer find the specs and so on, right? So what they did is they built their own NXP ontology, right? So that's an ontology about the, all the chips and the products and the specs that they made, right? Uh, so this was not to share background information, shared semantics with other parties outside the company. This was to share information and background knowledge between parties inside the company. Right? They took this uh, uh, NXP ontology, they wrapped this around every database that they could find, and this was a non-terminating process because they kept finding new databases. They didn't move any of the databases, they didn't change any of them, they just wrapped them uh, in this ontology. They made sure that every entry in that database had a web identifier, so they, they could address these things on their intranet, Right? So this is a completely internal application, but still using web technology. They could leave all the legacy applications that were running on, on all of these databases, they could just leave them intact. They were wrapping all the databases and linking them to this shared semantic store so that people could find information there. Right? Uh, so this was done by a group of people who didn't get uh, permission from their management to do it. So they had been struggling with this company-wide information integration for, for years. And they said, yeah, we're going to give it a new try. And the, and the management said, yeah, we've been there. Uh, it doesn't work. Go do something useful. So they did it anyway. Uh, they were very successful. They all quit, and they now start their own company. And uh, NXP is their uh, first big customer. Uh, so uh, this was so useful inside the company that uh, the company decided, well, actually, we can make a stripped-down version of this semantic store where we remove all the company confidential information and we make a limited version that's also available for our customers. So now it has also migrated to outside. And this is not customers like people like you and me browsing this. No, no. This is the information systems of their customers that are querying this. So this is really integration of information systems. Uh, so that was a search. We've done manufacturing. Um, uh, this is the media. Okay, so uh, in 2012, this was the most visited website in the world when the, the Olympics were in the UK. This was the website of the, the Olympic website of the BBC. Uh, and I thought that journalists were, until then, I thought that journalists, the job of a journalist was to write, to write new material. But it's not true. Right? Journalists don't write new material. They just take existing material and recombine it and put a very little bit of new information on the top. Right? So think of, I don't know, Usain Bolt. And there was some scare that he was, uh, he was positive on a doping test. Right? Okay, Usain Bolt, uh, Bolt uh, positive on doping, right? Okay, well, that's not an article, that's the headline, right? So now, you know, then you need to fill it up with background on his career. What other prizes did he win? What was his career? What team is he part of? Did he have other positive doping uh, uh, stories in the past? All of that stuff is in the archives of the BBC, but nobody can find it, 
right? So they built their own Olympic Games ontology, believe it or not, right? And that Olympic Games ontology talks about individual uh, uh, athletes, about the teams that they're part of, the countries that these teams represent, the events that they participate in, and so on, right? Uh, and this ontology was used by BBC journalists to find material in order to recombine it and much faster and much more productively fill the BBC website with new articles. And um, the New York Times is doing exactly the same. Um, uh, we'll see another media company later. Uh, so now actually all of the BBC is run this way. This was their first experiment. And, so, and just to show that this technology also scales, they had millions of hits per second on this information system, right? Because it was the most popular website in the world during the Olympics. And this scaled so well that they are now running the entire BBC information platform. So here's another example. Um, so the BBC, you all know them from their uh, wildlife programs, right? From Sir David Attenborough. And uh, together with these uh, fantastic wildlife programs, they also have websites with background information on all the animals and the habitats that they discuss. Actually, I don't know if this machine is online. So let's see what happens if I click on this URL. No, it's not online. Okay, so if you would click on the first URL, you would just get the regular web page. Okay, so information about the snow leopard, what it looks like, where it lives, that it's an endangered species, uh, where its place is in the animal kingdom, and so on. Right? That's just for you and me. If you take the same BBC URL and you only put .rdf at the end, you get the same information, but now as a knowledge graph. Okay, so BBC is feeding that information back out into the world so that your information system can use the same information that they are using. And not only are they feeding it to the world, they are only also relying on external uh, uh, information uh, sources from the semantic web. So this started out with their database on artists. So whenever a BBC plays a new artist or a band on the, on the radio, they put them on their website. And they had a team that was filling their information system with that information, and that information system was then used to power uh, their website, as we saw at the beginning. Right. And then they said, well, wait a minute, we're actually typing in a lot of stuff here that is already out on the web in, DBP, in, in Wikipedia or in CD Now or in Music Baby or all of these websites. So now with the, the linked open data cloud, they ran an experiment, but instead of using their own information system, they were using the information from the linked open data cloud, harvest it into the BBC, integrate it, and then use it to power their website. And then uh, we said, well, don't you think that's a scary thing for you? Because uh, you know, you're supposed to, uh, by, by, by legal charter, you must provide high uh, quality information to the British public. And now you're relying on all these open data sources. And they said, yeah, we thought it was scary. So we ran a test. And our own information system just had a little bit more errors in it. Okay? Uh, so, and this is also the story, of course, that we know from Wikipedia. Right? Uh, so they have now uh, uh, repurposed the people on that team. They do other jobs, and they are using external information, integrate it, use it to power their website, and then feed it back into the world. And if they find an error on DBpedia, what do they do? They fix it. Where? On DBpedia. So that they get the new information in, and everybody else also gets the improved information. So here's government. This is the American government. Um, this was very uh, working very well under the Obama in administration. Somehow, this is not working so well anymore. Uh, the, uh, the U.S. government uh, publishing uh, information. So here you see, for example, climate information about the uh, air pollution uh, in cities, uh, health information about the relationship between, say, the uh, percentage of smokers and tax on cigarettes, uh, quality of internet in different places. Uh, so all of these open data that the government has. So typically, the government used to publish this in reports. And these reports were PDF. Okay. So what can you do with the table in PDF? Nothing. Okay. So now, they are not just publishing the table in PDF. They're also publishing the underlying data on the linked data cloud. And lots of other governments in the world are doing this too. And as you see, Europe is very heavily uh, represented there. Um, Amazon, uh, so the, the biggest online retailer on the planet. Actually, this is the knowledge graph that I just showed you before about these artists. And it was a snapshot of the knowledge graph that Amazon has internally. Right? Uh, so what is their ambition? Their ambition is we aim at building 
an authoritative knowledge graph for all products in the world. Okay, well, okay, you can't deny them an ambition. Okay, uh, and they are getting pretty close, right? So they are. So this is a public knowledge graph, right? This comes from DBpedia and from Internet Movie Database, and they are using this as background knowledge to link with all their own internal products, right? So that they know that. Uh, uh, Robin Wright, if somebody searches for Robin Wright, that she's not for sale. She's not a product, right? But she's linked to products. And how is she linked to products? Because she stars in them, because she directs them, and so on. So they make a, you, you know how many, uh, how big Amazon is in terms of products. They have a product and knowledge graph that combines all of them, and they use that to power their website and to integrate with their suppliers, right? of which there are tens of thousands. Um, Uber is another one, right? So, uh, so this is for Uber Eats. Uh, so the, the food supplier that uh, delivers uh, food from your city to your door. Um, so uh, somebody comes to Uber and types in a query. And now Uber needs to figure out what it was that you meant, right? Uh, and they need to know. So typically they know where you are, where you are living. Uh, they know a lot about your personal profile. They need to disambiguate your query uh, and link it to your personal preferences to give you the best uh, product suggestions. Right? So they are using a, a knowledge graph to organize all what they know about food right? so that they can disambiguate queries that come into their system and give people the best uh, uh, suggestions for delivery options. Right, so they start with lots of raw data sources. They all turn them into knowledge graphs. They integrate these knowledge graphs, gives them a huge knowledge graph, and this they use to power the core service of their business. Okay. And they built their own Uber food ontology uh, to do this. Uh, last example, uh, Reuters. So this is fairly recent, in uh, uh, just before Christmas, actually in October, November. Uh, uh, Reuters, so Thomson Reuters, who are they? So they are the company that uh, supplies news, right? So they supply news items to journalists and also to investors. Uh, so uh, if a company has a, a change of CEO, then the investors want to know immediately because it may affect the stock price, right? Uh, so Reuters sends out millions and millions of these very short messages into the world that are being read by journalists and investors and Oh, actually, they figured out it wasn't read by journalists or investors. It was read by the, was read by the computers of journalists and investors, right? And then these investment computers were figuring out, were reading that the CEO of a company was changing and that it might affect the stock price. So then they thought, well, we may as well stop sending out text, right? We may as well send out bits of structured information. So they built a very large knowledge graph about companies. So their estimate is that this is now somewhere between two and three billion facts about companies on the planet. Who owns what? Who is located where? Who pays tax where? Uh, what is the legal status of the company? What are the relationships between them? Right? Um, so, for example, this red line right, is a derived ownership link. So nobody says that this company is owned by this company, but you can derive this by following all these links in the graph and saying that indirectly this company owns that company. Uh, and they are using this as a paid service. So you can take a paid subscription to the Thomson Reuters knowledge graph, and you can fire queries at this Thomson Reuters knowledge graph, which is updated at millions of events every year uh, to drive uh, your investment decisions. Okay, so uh, I could keep doing this for a long time, but you get the picture now, right? So these are all companies that have decided that whatever their mission in life is, and whether it's manufacturing or media or government or uh, news and so on, they've all adopted uh, this uh, semantic technologies, this linked open data, this linked data web, uh, to, to run their information systems. Okay, so this is my attempt at distilling the patterns here. Right, so what are the patterns that, that, that we are seeing? Well, the first pattern I'm seeing, and this is not my quote, this is the, the quote from from the global head of innovation of Thomson Reuters, the future is graph shaped, right? So we're no longer building databases. These databases, are, the, model, the data models there are much too restrictive, right? The semantics is much too implicit. In order to fit whatever the real world looks like into your database schema is uh, much too difficult. So these 
uh, knowledge graphs are a much better medium for modeling and integrating information. So he says, no, the future is graph shape. That is one pattern that you see in all of these applications. The second uh, pattern is that companies now really begin to outsource some of their core information, right? So Google is uh, relying on the semantic annotations that other people are given, are giving to make up the markup on their front page. Right? So they are not reading the web, doing their own analytics and figuring out that there's two Utrechts, one is a city and one is a province. They're relying on some unknown organization, uh, well, who knows who put it in DVPDA or in some Dutch government website, uh, but they are relying on that information, harvesting it, sure, they are curating it and integrating it, and then using it to power their primary product. So they are outsourcing some of their information. Amazon is um, uh, using the linked open data cloud, is relying on the linked open data cloud as the semantic backbone to integrate all of their products right, and to interlink all of their products. So the knowledge about their product buyers and their prices is theirs, that's internal, but they're using an external information source to interlink it. And we've seen Uber was doing exactly the same. Now, Reuters is now offering this as a service, right? saying to other companies, well, no, you, we make this information public, you can outsource some of your information need by paying us, right? and we're using knowledge graphs as a vehicle to do it. Right. So, uh, I was thinking, so what is the picture that emerges here? Remember when the cloud started to become very popular? So, what have we done in the cloud? We are also outsourcing. But in the cloud, we are outsourcing storage and we're outsourcing computing, right? But the, your, the, the content of your information is still yours. Okay, you may store it in some cloud and you may compute with it in some cloud, but it is your information. It's just physically somewhere else. You don't need to buy the hardware anymore. Great. Uh, but you've outsourced the computing, you've outsourced the storage, but you haven't outsourced the information. Right? What these companies are doing, they are even outsourcing their information. So that gives a very different picture on what information system architectures begin to look like from what we have seen until now. And I'm very happy to hear what you think about this picture. Thanks very much. There is uh, room for questions. Uh, I see a question in the back, please. Uh, thank you very much. I really enjoyed your presentation. You put together a lot of things that I knew bits and pieces of, but put it into a, a whole picture. Thank you. Uh, my question is, uh, you, you paint a very rosy picture here. What do you see as limitations sure. of this? Fair question. Um, so, uh, one problem d doesn't go away. It becomes solvable, but not for free, semantic integration. Right? So, we still have to align our ontologies. Right? And sometimes we do this by enforcing a single ontology. That's what happens in the search world. But you say, okay, if you don't use schema.org, we'll ignore your information. Okay, so that's just enforcing it from the top. In other fields, people have different ontologies and they're aligning them. Um, so you have one museum using one ontology, another museum using another ontology, and you need to align them. So schema alignment, that's the old database schema alignment problem. So that problem is still with us. Um, now we understand better how to solve it, and we can use the web, we can use these much richer ontologies than the database schemas, but ontology alignment, so heterogeneity of vocabularies, that's one problem. The other problem is uh, is trust, okay? So this was the question we asked at the BBC. Well, don't you think it's scary to use this information from the outside? Uh, so in the web, we have learned to live with this, right? So I remember Tim Berners-Lee telling us this story that when he was uh, trying to push the web early 90s, people would say, ah, but then everybody can point to anything and then it will become a big mess. And guess what, right? So the web is a big mess, but we have somehow learned to live with the mess. Right? So we have search engines that do proper ranking and we understand how to use domain names to decide reliability. And uh, uh, we have registers of phishing sites and we have all these mechanisms for dealing with the mess. I think we are not yet very good at, at uh, these trust improving measures on the semantic web. So I think those two 
are definitely still open problems to work on. Questions here in front. Uh, pass, please. Uh, can you use the mic for the other people? Um, so somehow this is about uh, organizing information and it relates to interpretability of, interpretability of humans. And I was wondering to what degree is populating this whole graph a human effort or are there general, general approaches that automate this? And right. How yes. do you ensure quality? Right. So, uh, okay, so those are two separate questions. So the first one is, is this a human effort? No. So we didn't get to a billion statements or 100 billion statements by typing them in. So a lot of these are actually populated from uh, legacy databases that have been either turned into a knowledge graph or have a wrapper around them so that to the outside they look like a knowledge graph. So that's a big source. Okay. Uh, another big source is uh, 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 harvesting this from unstructured data sources. So for example, text, like government reports. Right? So a lot of the open data from the American government, they actually scrape them from their own PDFs because they have no idea where the table is anymore. Right? So, and then it becomes a bit noisy. Right? So then quality becomes a problem. Uh, so there are different ways in which to populate these. Some of them have kind of high quality um, associated with them. Other ones are a bit more noisy, but almost nothing is human. There are some which are crowdsourced. So for example, the website that I had on CD Now, which is pretty much every CD that we could possibly think of is there with the metadata. So artists, songs, length of songs, composers, and so on. That's crowdsourced. So those are the three main sources. Uh, the there was a question lady, the yeah. Can you use the mic for the other people? Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much for your talk. It was very interesting. I was wondering um, if all these companies, big companies that are really using semantic web, are uh, using uh, the technologies that are currently available for researchers, uh, and uh, like which kind of, for instance, query languages ah. and technologies are they really? Ah, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, so there is a so of course there is an official semantic web stack, right? And mm -hmm. the stack reads RDF for the graph, RDF schema, and OWL mm -hmm. for the uh, for the semantic annotations, Sparkle as the query language. Okay, um, and um, there is a very broad spectrum of as to what people are using or not. So, for example, Amazon uh, they recently came on the market with their own RDF triple store. Uh, and it was basically what they built internally. Uh, and then they said, oh, well, this is actually working so well. We can make money out of this by selling this to other people. So they are using internally just the regular semantic web stack uh, and uh, applying it. All the big database vendors. So if you buy an Oracle database, you didn't know it, but you already have a triple store. Because just the regular Oracle database uh, can store RDF and can uh, answer Sparkle queries. Of course, they do this by internally translating it to whatever technology they already had, but it is a triple store. There are other companies which use the, right, the same data models and the same architecture, but they use their own in-house technology. Uh, but there is a big uh, value for adopting these, uh, <coughs> these public standards. There's a, a countryman, Ruth, who has a question. Yes, please. Yeah, thank you for this uh, very interesting talk. And um, thinking about uh, a number of things that you said, the last pattern that you mentioned here, that the semantic web does for content, uh, what the cloud does for, did for computing and storage, so I think maybe there's a refinement of, of this. Of the, all the examples that you mentioned, uh, it, it struck me that the information can be encoded in a context-free and unambiguous way. That's one element. And the other element is that uh, uh, important stakeholders benefit from publishing. Yeah. Uh, and if those two conditions are not satisfied, uh, maybe this is not a good way to go. Right. So I agree with you. And uh, I, think the I think there are very nice principles to identify. And I think the, the second one is, is true, but not problematic. So well, if I, there are no players that benefit from it, then nobody will use well, it. Well, I said okay. important stakeholders, but I should have said powerful stakeholders. Ah. Um, mm, OK, so of course, I choose the household names for, for, uh, for ease of explanation. But um, uh, 
I think there are also examples where uh, in a community, many small players get together. And you see this in science, for example. So in the life sciences, uh, life scientists are now publishing their, their information, the, the genomes that they map and, and so on, uh, in uh, these data formats. So this is a community of small players. So of course, there must be players that benefit from this, but it doesn't always have to be this sort of a monopolistic, uh, asymmetric uh, landscape. So the, I, I disagree a little bit on the second. On the first one, is much more uh, painful principle. So you said, indeed, there is some notion of context-free publication here, right? So one party is using information in their own context, they publish it, and then the unspoken assumption is that some other party can reuse that information in their own context, right? That's what you're, and this is a, uh, uh, we all know it's not true. Uh, we all know that information is contextualized. Uh, and what these ontologies do is somehow make explicit and make computer interpretable part of that context, but you never succeed in making available all of that context. So that is certainly a, an, an upper bound on, on the applicability of this. More that first principle, I think, than the second. Yeah. Uh, there's the mic coming. Regarding, I would like just to jump uh, into the, your last answer regarding the upper bound and lower bound. Ah. In your example of uh, married wit, I also think that the upper bands and lower bands are context dependent and time dependent. Yeah. Because today you are telling person is married to person. Ah. 20 years ago, we were telling a woman is married yeah. to a man. Absolutely true. You told that we all know that a person is married to only one person. No. And we all know that this is not true everywhere in the world. Right. Yeah. So uh, where is the truth? Yeah, yeah. No, so, so uh, actually, uh, just a month ago, I was uh, in the north of Nepal, where the, Tib the culture is Tibetan. And there, uh, the, the ancient culture is that a woman is married to multiple males. Uh, so they wouldn't be surprised by this uh, IDF graph at all. Uh, so you're completely right, and I think those are very good examples of, of what, what Ru was saying, that that they are they're all context dependent, but you also saw that it's the ontology that tries to capture some of that context, and of course you need to, and it's time dependent for sure, right? Uh, so it changes over, time. so the context differs from place to place or from organization to organization, and also from time to time, even within the same organization. All of that is true. And, and the attempt here is to capture at least the necessary parts of the context in the ontology. And now, the richer the ontology is, the more you capture and the less there is space for misunderstandings. Uh, but yeah, so, and this doesn't come for free. Yeah? So this was the very first question. So now what are the, the costs of this technology? What are the non-rosy parts? Well, you have to make this ontology because otherwise you're just sending dark blobs around. Yeah, no, so, so all of this is a perfectly fair point. And, and, also, can okay. almost go back. Uh, and, and we shouldn't forget the other half of the room. I'm uh, scanning them. So. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, very nice talk. Very appreciated. Thanks. Uh, I have a question. You know that uh, since end of May, the GDPR uh, ah. came in force in Europe. Yeah. Uh, it's clear that uh, GDPR is applicable to all organizations. And with what you are presenting, those organizations are more and more becoming virtual. And the question is, uh, what are the key challenges you can see regarding the application of GDPR to this yeah. uh, open world of data? Okay, so uh, uh, fair point, good question. Uh, what makes this hard in the light of GDPR, what makes GDPR hard in the light of this is not the individual data sets. Because for an individual data set, you can ask the GDPR questions, right? Uh, and, and ensure whether or not you, in, that you are living by the rules. But the whole point of publishing these data sets is linking them. And we all know that privacy is uh, very uh, fragile uh, when you are linking information. That things which may look anonymized in one data set and which may look anonymized in another data set are no longer anonymized if you link these two data sets. Uh, and this makes linking and integration so much easier that it now suddenly becomes much more easy to inadvertently uh, break uh, these uh, uh, these guidelines. So yeah, that is uh, definitely something that um, 
uh, that requires careful thought. Um, and in a way, um, this technology is, uh, now I don't want to use the word dangerous, but it is at risk. Right? So you create more risks. So you create more benefits, you also create more risks. Yeah. The gentleman over here. Thank you. Uh, my, thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was a great one. My initial question was about the uh, privacy. So I right. couldn't li uh, not link this uh, presentation with the Cambridge Analytics uh, Facebook case. Ah. Yeah, and my, my, question, my, my question was, well, do you think that uh, these regulations that we are seeing today are enough in order to secure the future of this technology? And uh, yeah, that's... Um, so, uh, so uh, it's certainly true that, okay, so until now, you needed to be very smart to link up all these data sources. So you had tweets, you had Facebook, you had uh, whatever other information that, that Cambridge Analytica had access to, and you needed to be really smart and lots of uh, work to integrate these sources. And that integration has now become easier because of this technology. That was the whole point of it. Right, so yeah, that also makes it easier to use the te the same integration technology for purposes that we don't like so much. So yeah, that's in a way it's a well known picture, right? That this technology can be used both for good things and for not so good things. Uh, and it's certainly true that this technology is open for both users. Okay, so, so the, the standard joke in semantic web is that you're only successful if somebody's using your technology to sell porn. Uh, and that hasn't happened yet. So uh, we're not there yet. Um, uh, one interesting combination, uh, one interesting thing that people have begun to think about is the combination of this with blockchain technology. So with blockchain technology, you can sort of verify the origin of information, right? And then so you could at least, the, the, the trust question that came up very early on in the session, you could use blockchain technology to at least verify where this knowledge graph came from, or where this link between knowledge graphs came from. And so that is now a very active part of, of research. Frank, I, I'd like you to come to an end, even though I realize there are maybe more questions. Frank has uh, already pledged to attend the rest of the day, so you may see him walking around. Uh, don't be afraid to uh, Please. address him, right. uh, raise your questions. I'd like to take the privilege uh, to, to ask a question which I know is on the mind of a, of a large part of, of our community. We often see that we often are interested in the, in the, sorry, in the beliefs and the knowledge that people have within organizations about the things they do, the procedures which are in place, right. uh, the rules they follow, uh, uh, their understanding of, of, uh, of particular, uh, the content of things they do. I know that in your earlier uh, career, you have also been working on expert systems and also on, 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 on representing human knowledge. Is this another type of, of information or knowledge that you would represent in a different way, or would you also favor the technologies that you have been describing? No, so, so there is a direct, so the knowledge intensive part here are the ontologies, yes. right? In the ontologies, you capture the explicit and implicit knowledge, the context, if you want, yep. that you need to share information. Yep. Right? And these ontologies are where we capture that. And these ontologies have a direct line to work on knowledge engineering and knowledge representation that dates back to the 90s. Okay. Yeah, good. Thank you very much. So I'd like to have a token oh. of appreciation. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.